had passed so quickly by How the time had flown Two brothers came before the Lord To an altar made of stone Each one had a sacrifice Obeying God's command The one had fruit to offer the other a spotless land. His son lay on the altar, bound for death it seemed. The knife was raised above his head, as in the fire it gleamed. And from a bush behind him, God showed Abraham the only perfect substitute was the blood of a spotless lamb. Only a lamb could pay the debt for the sin of all mankind. And the lamb was all God wanted to seal redemption's price. No substitute was worthy, there could be no other plan. For perfect peace with heaven, take the blood of a spotless lamb. My friend, if you're uncertain about your destiny, if heaven's just hope you have, then listen carefully. You can't work your way to God, there is no other plan. The only way to heaven is through Jesus, God's spotless sin of all mankind, and the Lamb was all God wanted to seal redemption's price. No substitute was worthy, there can be no other plan. The only way to heaven for perfect peace and heaven, the only way Jesus, God's spotless land. And there is no other way to heaven but through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, all kiddos who are part of a children's church. What age group is that, Pastor? Up to sixth grade by your lead moms and dads and um, all of those in charge who are waking up right now. You can be dismissed towards the back of the auditorium. Can you check that man's ID? He looks a little bit too old. All right. And the rest of you, you're stuck. You have to stay here. It always hurts my feelings how excited all the kids look to, to uh, be able to leave, especially when it's my children smiling the biggest. But hey, part of being a dad, I guess. All right, the rest of us, let's take our Bibles this morning and turn with me, please, to the book of Matthew. And we're going to spend several minutes in the time that we have together in Matthew chapter number 22. Matthew and the 22nd chapter. And we'll give just a minute for the kiddos to find their places in there. That's going to be a full <laughs> class back there. Looks like a lot of fun. Matthew 22. And Pastor already introduced us, but just in case we've not yet had the opportunity to meet, let me just let me just introduce um, my family to you all, and I don't expect you to remember it. And um, I'll remind you if you remind me, kind of deal. You know, if if I can't remember your name, then you say hello to me. And if you can't remember my name, then I'll give my name to you. It's not a problem. Uh, my name is Tim Thompson. My wife is Brittany. Brittany, do you mind just standing here in the Miss America way? This is my wife, Brittany. 
And we've been married for 16 years, and God has blessed us with three boys. Seth, who's 10, Samuel, who is 5, and then Asher, who is 2 years of age. And as Pastor mentioned, we have, we have the very distinct privilege of being able to travel around to different churches and to preach in revival meetings um, all over the United States. So, uh, let's see, the last meeting we held would have been in, where were we, babe? Plaque. And, okay, so yeah, we were in Plaque, Plaque, Florida, which is north of here quite a ways. And then before that, we were in uh, Tennessee and Oklahoma and and uh, Georgia and Michigan and a lot of different places. But as the weather gets colder, we come south. Not because we're, um, you know, it's more spiritual to come south, just because the trailer can't handle anything that cold. And so uh, we try to get out of that kind of weather. But we're really glad to be able to be here with you all this week. And Pastor mentioned about coming to the services. And sincerely, you, you are welcome. Even if you're a guest here this morning, and I'm a guest as well, so I don't know everybody that is a guest or is not. Whether it's your normal habit to come back on Sunday night or to come for special nights of meetings, I would invite you cordially to come to every service that you possibly can. Again, tonight at 6, and then Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday at 7 o'clock here, and then we'll be out in Miami Beach on Thursday and Friday, and we would love to have you come to every service that you can. If the only way you can come is to come in late, like, uh, you know, you work and you get off at 5.30 and it takes you an hour and a half to drive anywhere in this area and you get here at, at uh, 7, 7.30 or whatever, that's absolutely fine. The services will not be unnecessarily long throughout the evening. We'll, we'll, we'll take enough time to look at something from the scriptures, but they won't be long. I'm aware of your need to get rest and your days of work and things like that. But each service that you come to, I'm confident that God will speak to your heart if you come with a, with a desire to hear God to hear God uh, work. And if a desire isn't there in your heart right now, well then come anyway. Maybe God will give you the desire. And the more you hear His word, like, I'm confident the more God will give you a desire to hear the things that you need to hear. But I'm glad that you're here this morning. Thanks for coming. Matthew 22. I love this passage. We're going to look in just a moment at several verses. However, this morning, we're going to start off with a quiz. And this is a quiz that I love to give. I've given it many, many times, and it's always interesting to me to hear the answers. Now, for some of you, it's been a while since you've taken quizzes. You're going to have to wipe off the dust from that part of your brain. But we're, I'm going I'm to give you this quiz. I'm going to ask you some questions, and I want you to answer out loud. And don't be, don't, if you're thinking to yourself, Brother Tim, are you going to embarrass me if I give an answer that doesn't match your answer? No, I won't do that. Now, if it's Brother Andrew that does it, I might make fun of him just because we have that relationship. But the rest of you, I, I won't do that to you. The quiz goes thusly. I'm going to give to you a vocation. I'm going to tell you who someone is, and I want you to tell me um, what a person in that vocation does. Um, for instance, if I say uh, a baker, you would say bakes because that's what a baker does. Okay, so let's just practice with that one just to make sure you're not afraid to answer out loud in church time. All right, so a baker. Bakes. Well done, class. You're doing very well at 100% thus far. Uh, baker bakes. A fisherman. Fishes. You should know that around here. A baker bakes. A fisherman fishes. Um, a pilot. Flies. A pilot flies. Um, a seamstress. So. They don't seem, guys. A seamstress sews. So a baker bakes, a fisherman fishes, a pilot flies, a seamstress sews. Um, a Christian? Praise. <laughs> and you guys were doing really, really good up to this point right here. And then you fell out on me. And in case you're wondering, Brother Tim, are you setting us up? Of course I'm setting you up. But have an answer ready anyway. We're going to start back at the beginning of the quiz. And I want you to go ahead. Have an answer ready. Whatever it is, just... Whatever you think it is, just blurt it out. All right, here we go. Ready? A baker? Bakes. A pilot? Pies. A fisherman? Fishes. A seamstress? Sows. A Christian? <laughs> Some of you still didn't answer, and uh, that's okay, because, because it is kind of a question that you go, um, there's a number of things that I might say, uh, but to try to boil everything down. Well, let, let me ask you this. If a baker doesn't know that his main job is to bake, will he be successful as a baker, yes or no? No. 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 Um, or if a fisherman doesn't know that he's supposed to fish, um, is he going to do well as a fisherman? No. 
No. Or a uh, seamstress regarding sewing? Or would you be interested in jumping on the airplane piloted by a person who didn't know that their main job was to fly the plane? Is that is that where you want to is that where you want to fly? Well, obviously not. So a the success, forgive the term, but the success of a baker is based upon the fact that he's supposed to bake and that's what he does. Or a fisherman that he's supposed to fish, or a seamstress that she's supposed to sew, or a, uh, a, a pilot that he's supposed to fly, or she's supposed to fly. Um, all of these things, all of these vocations, is necessary for them to understand what their main job is, and then to, to make sure that that stays their main focus. Now, there may be a number of other things that a baker does, or a pilot does, or a fisherman does, or a seamstress does, but they have to stay focused on the main thing for them. Well, then I, I would submit to you that the same thing is true when it comes to a Christian. That while there's a lot of different things that you or I might do as a Christian, as a believer, if we're not, if we're not focused in on what the most important thing is, what the main thing is, that we're not going to be able to be successful, forgive the term again, the way that we're supposed to be. So then I wonder to myself, is there a right answer? Is there one answer? Somebody I heard say praise, I heard somebody else say worship, a number of different things. Somebody could say read the Bible or witness uh, or glorify God, a number of different things that somebody could say. Is there a right answer? What is the most important thing? Well, did you know that somebody came and asked the Lord Jesus almost the exact same question? A little bit different wording, but basically the same question. And it's found in Matthew 22. And the brief time that we have together this morning, I just want to share this with you. And let me, let me say this as we look at this passage. In the scriptures, there have been several passages of the Bible that have, um, that, that have been significant in my life. They've been life-changing to me. Matthew 22, and the truth that I'm about to share with you, is one of the top three that God has used to change my heart, my life. And so when I share this with you, I don't, even, I don't just share with you a, a, a mental exercise. This is something that has impacted my life, and I, I want you to get this as well. Now, we have distractions around us, obviously, with the kiddos back here, and uh, it's getting, you've been sitting for a little while, and you might be a little warm, or whatever the case may be. But if there's ever been a time, if there has ever been a time when you want to discipline yourself, the key in on what's being said, it's now. Sincerely, this is important. Look at Matthew chapter 22, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 34, where we read the passage here, where basically the same thing is asked of the Lord Jesus that I've asked of you this morning. The Bible says this in verse 34, but when the Pharisees, this, this would be a religious group of people, had heard that Jesus had put the Sadducees to silence. So we have Pharisees and Sadducees, two religious groups of people that came to the Lord Jesus and would try to trick him up by asking questions because they didn't like him. The Bible says that these Pharisees were gathered together. Verse 35, then one of the Pharisees, which was a lawyer, now don't, when you hear lawyer, don't think he sues people, but think he studied the law of God. He was a lawyer, someone who studied the Bible. He asked Jesus a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Okay, stop real quickly and look up here. We're going to read the other verses in just a minute. But basically, the idea of what is taking place here is, this Pharisee comes to Jesus and he says to him, uh, Master, what is the main thing? What is the most important truth that there is in the law. The law would have been the word from God to the people of Israel. And this man, as a Jewish man, considered himself to be a child of God. And he comes to Jesus and he says, what, what is the most foundational, the most important thing of all the laws in the scripture, of all the laws in the Bible, of everything that God said to us, what's the main thing? And Jesus answers him in verse number 37. He says unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Verse 40 says, On these two commandments hang all the law in the prophets. Okay, now, now pay attention to what, what has been said here. He says, he says in verse number 37 that the most important thing is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, 
and that you, the second is like unto it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. And then in verse number 40, and this verse grabs my attention, verse 40 says, on these two commandments, what two commandments? You, you can answer me. What two commandments is he talking about here? Okay, love, your, love God, and then love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, he says, hang all the law and the prophets. What, what's that about? That, that is just setting up these two commandments of loving God and loving others as being the ones upon which all the other things that you and I say a Christian should, whatever, those things all get taken care of when I focus my mind and my heart, my time, my energy, and my effort on the main commandments, which are loving God and loving other people. Now, specifically, in the time that we have together this morning, I want us to focus in on loving God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Because this, this truth, this truth is absolutely transforming. Um, have, just out of curiosity, I don't know if any of you are travelers. Have any of you ever seen Niagara Falls? Okay. Oh, well, several of you have. Okay. Niagara Falls is significant. If you haven't seen it in person, you've seen pictures of it, I'm sure, or seen it on TV. It really is. It, it is significant. When you go there, it's almost surreal. When you look at it, it's almost like, oh, wow. That, 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 can't, that cannot be real. Because of the massive amount of water that's pouring over the edge of Niagara Falls and the, and the mist that comes shooting up, it's just, it's really, it's really, really something. Okay, the, the way that I lived my life as a Christian, I was saved when I was, a, when I was a young kid. I was five years old, four or five years old when I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And I grew up in a good home, a Christian home. And honestly, my desire was I wanted to serve God. I wanted to please God with my life. Not to say that I was perfect by any stretch. You can ask my parents. But, but my desire was to serve God. But let me, let me tell you what ended up happening. In my desire to serve God, I thought to myself, all right, I need to keep all of God's commandments and do all the things that God wants me to do and be the right kind of person. And it ended up to where I felt like I was standing in the middle of Niagara Falls doing my best to keep the water from going over the falls. Meaning, I would think to myself, okay, as a good Christian, a good Christian, I'm supposed to pray. I need to make sure I have that taken care of. And I'm supposed to witness. And I need to make sure I'm reading my Bible, and I'm memorizing Scripture, and I'm being kind to other people, and I am, uh, I'm giving in church, and I'm doing all of these things, and I felt like there's no way for me to handle, to do all the things that it is that I'm supposed to do. There's too much for me to take care of every day, and I end up felt feeling guilty of all the things I wasn't taking care of or not doing the best um, that I thought I should do on this when I'm trying to do this and I, how can I do all these things? And it was like standing out in the middle of the falls trying to keep the water from going over the edge of the falls and all life was happening all around me and circumstances of things that I got to do right and take care of this situation. And it was just, it was overwhelming to try to, forgive me, be a Christian and take care of all this stuff and do it to what I thought was the satisfaction of God and the other people who expected me to live the way that, that the Bible says I'm supposed to live. Until this truth came to light in my mind. Someone shared it with me, and it was like the, the click, the bulb that comes on. Where God says here, the Lord Jesus says, look, if you will give yourself to loving God, with all your heart, soul, and mind, that you don't have to live going like this. Those things, when I love God with everything that's in me, those things just naturally happen. On these two commandments, loving God and loving others, hang all the law and the prophets. Everything else just falls in line the way that it's supposed to. So here's the statement for this morning. And, and if you ever take notes, if you ever write anything down, this is what you want to write down. If you have a good memory, blessings upon you, here's what you want to remember from this morning. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. There's nothing more important than your relationship with God. A baker bakes... A fisherman fishes, a pilot flies, a seamstress sews, and a Christian has to love God 
with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind. Another passage says, all of their strength. And if I will take care of that and loving others. And the Bible says everything else that's supposed to happen will happen the way that it's supposed to. Now here's, here's the deal then. Then it becomes, okay, how do I do that? How do I love God with all my heart, soul, and mind? Well, a couple things. Um, well, I'll tell you what, and just, just for sake of time, let me give, let me give you four, four things specifically. If, if there's nothing more important than my relationship with God, and there's not, this is provable from this passage. When you think of creation, God created mankind for the purpose of having a relationship with Him. When sin entered the world and that relationship was broken by sin, then God sent His Son for the purpose of bringing us to God, of being the one who could be the mediator so that sinful man could be made, could be brought back into right connection with God. All of this, all of salvation, all of the death of Christ, all of Christianity centers around this, this one main um, subject of my relationship with God. Okay, so if, if there's nothing more important than my relationship with God, and there's not, then four things need to be true. Number one, make sure it's God that you love. Make sure it's God that you love. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The, the point is, look, one of the temptations for all of us, even for those of us who've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, is it's, real, it's really easy for our hearts to be drawn away from uh, being in love with God. Satan is very good at just trying to get our just trying to get our attention off of our relationship with the Lord. Even if he has to do it with things that seem okay or seem good, he'll do everything that he can to get us off of, of dedicating our heart and our mind to our relationship with the Lord. Okay, so make, make sure it's God that you love. In other words, be alert and aware of anything, anything that begins to pull your heart away from the Lord. I'm not saying, nor is the Scripture teaching, that you can't do anything besides read your Bible and pray every day. It's not, it's not what the Bible's talking about here. What it's talking about here is not living life blind to the fact that there's a devil who wants, who wants my heart to be yanked away from my relationship with the Lord. And, now forgive me for being specific, but if he has to use um, a hobby to do it, fine. Or if he wants to, if, if, if he can use social media, great. If he can use family, okay. He'll use if he if he has to use if he has to use ministry in order to pull my heart away from the Lord. And Satan will use anything he can just so that I'm not focused on my relationship with God. And things that in and of themselves are okay, a house, a job family, things that are good, those things, when they get out of uh, out of right place and priority, can begin to pull my heart away. Let, let me just share with you real quickly something that, that a young lady shared with us. When I was sharing this truth with a, with a church up in Alaska, a young lady brought a letter to Brittany and I, and she, she gave it to us, just giving basically her testimony of God having taught her this. And in, in, as she gave it to us, she said, for me, this is, she was talking to us about herself. She said, for me, um, Facebook was something that, that Satan had used to pull my heart away from God. Not, not that Facebook in and of itself is wrong. Now, I kind of wish it was so I could preach against it, but I, it's not, so I can't. But um, she, she said, I realized that on a daily basis, I was checking in with God three times a day, but I was checking in on Facebook about 35 times a day. And she said, it hit me that this was something that was being used to pull my heart away from the Lord. Satan's not, a, you, you understand that Satan's not above using anything in order to try to get, okay, now look, a baker bakes, a pilot flies, a seamstress sews, a fisherman fishes, a Christian, in order to be successful as a believer, must love God with all heart, soul, mind, and strength. Make sure it's God that you love. Don't let, don't let money, home, uh, hobbies, passions, friends, don't let those things get out of place so that they begin to pull your heart away from, from God himself. Number two. So number one, uh, make sure it's God that you love. Number two, ask God to increase your love. 
Ask God to increase your love. Hey, did you know that God loves to answer prayer? Sometimes we have the idea of God that um, if, if we have a prayer request, that it's like God is uh, up in heaven and he doesn't want to answer it. But if he has to, then, okay, I'll answer it because you met all the qualifications. So, all right, I'll answer. It's not the way God is. God loves to answer prayer. He loves to answer prayer when we pray things that are according to his will. And let me tell you a request that's constantly according to his will. If you come to God and you say, God, would you please help my heart? Would you please help me to love you more? Would you please bind my heart to yours and help me to pant after you like a deer pants after the water brook? That is a request that God loves to answer. And if you're, if you're finding yourself, and, and I, I have in my life, and so I'm assuming other people do, if you find yourself ever where you don't desire God the way that you ought to, I mean, you know it, like you've grown kind of cold to the things of God. I mean, you may still come to church and do all the stuff you're supposed to do because you know it's right and, and um, you, you want to want God. You want to love God, but you've grown a little bit cold. But let me tell you something. If you'll come to God and say, God, would you please help me to love you more. Please, God, help my heart to desire you. That is a prayer request God loves to answer. Now, I will say, just a fair warning, that when you ask God to increase your love for Him, it may be that God has to begin to pry your fingers off of some things that you didn't know you were holding on to so tightly. But I'm, the end result, the end result is a relationship with God that is the way that God would have, a, have it be so that we can be what we ought to be. Make sure it's God that you love. Ask God to increase your love. Number three, spend the time. Spend the time. Hey, did you know that relationships take time? How many of you were already aware of the fact that any relationship that's worth having takes time? Did you know this? Okay, this is true. If you're, if you're married uh, or if you want to get married um, or if you're hoping to get married someday, you, you need to know that relationships take time. Britt Brit and I met um, when we were freshmen in college. And we went to we went to a uh, small Christian college, and they had they had uh, rules about where we could go together and things like that. But we started dating at the end of our freshman year, and and fairly quickly, honestly, fairly quickly, um, we became we became pretty convinced that this relationship was going to go further than just hey we're friends and spending time together. Um, so so that for us it, it became real important. It wasn't like a drudgery. Uh, but it became really important for us to spend time. But let's just say, for sake of illustration, that, um, that we're starting in this relationship, and I, I liked her, and she liked me, and our time together really was at, at school. We would, we would eat breakfast, lunch, and supper or dinner together every day, and the rest of our time was filled with classes and other things that were going on. So that was our time to spend together. So every day we met for all the meals. So let's, let's just say, ladies, Let's just say that um, at the beginning of our relationship, after a few weeks, and we like each other and we think it's going to go somewhere, after a few weeks, um, I called Brittany one morning. Oh, uh, I see. It was before breakfast. Brittany, look. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I slept in. I'm not going to be able to make it to breakfast. I'll see you at lunchtime. Click. Lunchtime rolls around. I say, hey, Britt, look, I have a history quiz next hour, and I haven't studied for it. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not going to be able to eat lunch with you. I've got to go study. Supper time rolls around. Hey, Britt, guys are playing basketball tonight. It's going to be a great game. Um, I'm going to go. I'm going to go play ball tonight, but I'll see you tomorrow morning for breakfast. Next morning, <laughs> you're not going to believe this. Ugh, I'm not going to be able to make it. Slept in again. Click. Lunchtime rolls around. Ah, I have a Greek quiz next hour. I've got to learn Greek. I'm going to be a preacher. Why do I have to know it? I don't know. But I've got to go study my Greek. I've got to go learn it. I'm sorry. I'll see you at supper time. Supper time rolls around. I say, hey, Brent, look, tonight they're playing football. It's going to be a really good game. Oh, there's some of your friends. Why don't you go eat with your friends? And I'll see you tomorrow morning at breakfast. Okay. Now, ladies, you tell me, what, what's, what's going to happen to me in this relationship if that's, if that's how our relationship is? What's going to take place to me in this? Do you know what it means to get the boot? Well, that's exactly what's going to happen in the relationship. Why? Well, because any relationship that's worth anything is a relationship where time is spent. Okay, now look. Friends, listen. It's no different in our relationship with God. Time spent with our God is an absolute necessary thing 
If I'm going to have a heart for Him at all, if I'm, going to, if I'm going to be what He would have me be and do what He would have me do, then time spent, will you say, but I don't have a lot of time. All of us have the same amount of time. We may be stretched differently. That is, because of what God has called me to do, I may have more quote-unquote time that I can set apart to spend time look to reading His Word. And you may have just some, some, a few moments in the morning to look at what the Bible says, but that's not all there is of time spent together. Look, you can drive down the road and be talking to God. You can go throughout your day and mention things to the Lord on a regular basis in your heart. You can spend time with God. When a need comes up, it's not, don't, don't think, don't think that time spent with God has to be um, all um, memorizing Scripture or on your knees before Him. But wouldn't it be great to wake up in the morning and from a sincere heart, just to be able to say, good morning, Father. And have that be your relationship throughout the day. But that's exactly what God wants for us. This is what Christ bought with His blood on the cross. This is the reason for creation. This is the point of Christianity. This is the foundational truth. This is the beginning. This is the focal point. My relationship with God, and that happens as I spend time with Him. Hey, listen, if you're not spending time with God throughout the day, if you're not, if you're not talking to the Lord and listening to what He has to say, if you're not taking time to read His Word and learn from Him, listen, friend, look, 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 look. Forgive me, forgive me. You can want till the cows come home to be a good Christian, to be, forgive, successful. But it can't happen without, without this relationship with the Lord. And relationship with the Lord means I make sure that it's God that I love. I ask God to increase my love. I spend the time. And then lastly, live it out. Live it out. That is, um, loving God involves my um, doing the things that He would have me to do. Jesus Christ said this. In fact, finish the statement if you can. If you love me, Okay, keep my commandments. Okay, what's that all about? Uh, what it's all about is uh, God knows that if I will live in obedience to what He has for me to do, that all that does is stir up in me a heart for more of Him. In other words, if I, if I will in love do the things that the Lord Jesus said. For instance, the Lord Jesus Christ said this to His disciples. He said, okay, guys, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, that you have, you know, love, love one for another. Um, true religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Meaning that if I will reach out and love to other people, if I'll love you the way that I'm supposed to, I'm living in obedience to the Lord, I'm caring about others more than I care about myself, I let go of selfishness and I take hold of that which God taught us, which is to care about other people, then, then that just stirs in my heart a desire for more of God because as I give out, then I need more to come in. A lot of believers end up being very stagnant in their life because they learn, 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 learn. They come to church, they come to church, they listen, listen, listen. They may even read the Bible on a regular basis, but there's no outflow. There's no service. There's no, there's no reaching out to other people. And so everything comes in, nothing goes out. And where water comes in and nothing goes out, you end up with dead water, stagnant, useless water. The same thing is true for us. That I, in my life, I, I want to be someone that as I, as I spend time with the Lord and I see what it is that He has for me, that in service I reach out, and as I do that, then that just stirs my heart for God. And it causes me to desire God more. I, I'm, tell, I'm telling you, listen, there is nothing more important than your relationship with the Lord. Nothing. And if that's true, then I need to make sure it's God that I love. I need to ask God to increase my love. I need to spend the time. I need to live it out. And if, if my relationship with God will be what it should be, then everything else will take care of itself. You ready? A baker? Yes. A fisherman? Yes. A pilot, Lies. a seamstress, Lies. a 
Christian loves God. loves God with all their heart, soul, and mind. There is nothing more important than your relationship with God. Now, if you're convinced of this, may I encourage you with one last thing? We're going to pray, talk to the Lord about it, and our time will be done. If you're convinced of this, then don't, don't let Satan steal the seed of this Scripture from your heart and mind this afternoon. In other words, take some time to consider it. Um, I'm not ignorant of the world uh, in which we live and the things that are going on. Uh, so this afternoon there's big games on and there's stuff that's happening and, and like that. All, all, all I would suggest to you is before you just take on everything else, just take, take a few minutes to let this sink in and solidify in your mind. I'm not saying don't do anything else. We're not living in a monastery. It's the, that's not what this is about. But if this is important, and it is, then take time to let it sink in a little bit and consider it. And then, as God would move in your heart, as you know you ought to do, let's do it. He's a good God. It's a pleasure to be able to serve Him. Now, if one of these four things that were mentioned this morning, or several of them, apply to you like you go, oh, yeah, that needs to change in my life, about making sure it's God that you love. Maybe there's some things that you need to, to put back in proper priority, or perhaps set aside completely for a while, or if you've not been asking God to increase your love, or if you've not been spending time, or if you've not been living it out, and God has shown that to you this morning, then in just a minute, when I pray, would you just talk to the Lord about it? And I'd invite you just to bow your heart and your head where you sit and just say, God, you've shown this to me. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, then we would love, we would love to after the service be able to take the time to share with you how you can know for certain that you're on your way to heaven. That you can have this relationship with God by faith in Jesus Christ. And then you can know what it is to know this great God that we serve. And He is great. So, let's just take a minute and talk to the Lord. Would you bow your heads? Real quickly, before we just take a time where Brittany's just going to play a song of invitation on the piano, and we'll not sing, so you won't need a songbook, may I just ask how many this morning would say, by an upraised hand, just, just as an encouragement to other people, how many would say, Brother Tim, one or more of these four things? Again, making sure it's God that I love, asking God to increase my love, spending the time or living it out. One or more of these four things God has dealt my heart about, and I want this morning to be a turning point. And you'd say, um, Tim, as we pray in a moment, I'm going to be praying. And you'd say, please pray for me that I would do what God would have me to do about this. If God dealt your heart about something this morning, may I pray with you about it? Would you slip up your hand and just let me know so that I can pray with you? Okay, a number of hands. God bless you. Good. I will certainly pray with you and for you about it. And let me do this. Since, since there were several that raised their hands, let me just give just a moment. Britt, will you just play through one stanza of an invitation hymn? <coughs> And while she pray, plays, rather, you just talk to the Lord about it. If he dealt with you about something, right, right where you are, talk to God about it, will you? so that we might have a relationship with you. God, thank you for, the, for all the benefit, oh wow, all the blessings that come to us as a result of this relationship. Thank you for 
Um, the price that you paid. Lord Jesus, thank you for being obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, Lord, help us, please, to um, see the truth and to believe what your word has said. And God, I do pray for my, my brothers and sisters in Christ, those who have trusted your son, and they've been convinced of this truth or reminded of it. God, I do pray that you'd have help us to have protection from Satan, that he wouldn't steal this out of our minds, but because of the absolute value and importance of this subject matter, um, God, may it be preached over and over again by your Spirit in our hearts and our minds, and help us to act according to that which you said. We love you, Lord. Thank you for loving us. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we ask your help and blessing. Amen. Amen. Hey, thanks for your kind attention this morning. And uh, we'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock if you're able to come. And if you have any questions about um, trusting Christ as Savior or anything that's been said, then you're always welcome to come and ask. We're not afraid of questions. And if they're really, really hard, then I'll just refer you to a pastor, and that's not a problem at all. All right? Hey, God bless you. You're dismissed.